ludicrous number of hobbies to talk about instead. <laughs> Tonight, Jeff will be giving us his second project from the Competent Communicator Manual, Organize Your Speech. The title of his speech is Living in the Future. Please help me welcome Jeff Lee. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests. It's the year 2015. Where's my flying car? <laughs> okay, so we don't have those yet, but in many other ways, we really are living in the future. When I was a young boy of about seven or eight, my grandfather said to me, when I was your age, the most powerful machine on the planet was the steam locomotive, and now we've put men on the moon. I can't even imagine what the world is going to look like when you're my age. I'm still a couple of decades shy of that mark, but when I think about it, many of the things that existed only in the realm of science fiction back then are now reality. Look at Star Trek. Sure, we're not exploring the galaxy at Warp Factor 9, but some of the futuristic technology they showed as being commonplace in the 23rd century, we have today, and some of it's even old hat. For example, the communicator. <laughs> sure, they had handheld walkie-talkies back when the show aired for about 25 years, but they were big, bulky things with a range of about a mile on a good day if there were no trees in the way. So the idea of a handheld wireless device that could let you talk to someone hundreds of miles away and still be small enough to slip into a pocket was pure fantasy. But today we're walking around with cell phones that not only let us speak to people clear on the other side of the planet, but they're packed with things like full-color, high-definition video screens, cameras, music players, and literally thousands of times more computing power than all of the mission control mainframes from the Apollo moon landings put together. Lieutenant Uhura's wireless earpiece, we have Bluetooth headsets that are smaller. Surgical lasers, we've got those. Handheld devices that translate your speech into other languages, there are cell phone apps that do that. Doors that open automatically without having to step on a rubber mat first, we've had those for decades. In 1961, in the book Stranger in a Strange Land, Robert Heinlein dreamed up therapeutic hospital beds with mattresses filled not with springs or foam rubber, but with water. And by the 1970s, the water bed was the bed of choice for swinging bachelors. <laughs> well, it's true we don't have sarcastic robot maids or flying cars that fold down into briefcases like the Jetsons, we do have robotic vacuum cleaners, and telecommuting, and electric cars, and even prototypes of cars that drive themselves, which are probably still safer than giving a teenager a learner's permit for a flying car. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's a good thing we don't have those. Some science fiction authors predicted matter replicators, which would let you just press a button and they would create instantly whatever you wanted. We don't have the instantly part down quite yet, but as Kevin Collier discussed in one of the first speeches I heard here, we have additive manufacturing processes which build objects layer by layer out of plastics, metals, ceramics, other materials. They use 3D printers on the International Space Station, so instead of sending astronauts up with every conceivable tool they could possibly use, they just send up the raw materials and let them print what they want when they need it. And you don't even have to be a manufacturing company or NASA to get into that. Consumer 3D printers have been proliferating in the last few years, and it started coming down in price to the point where they're actually affordable now. If you could just press a button and make anything you wanted, what would you do? Would you make tools? Replace broken knobs? Make sculptures? Toys? Or even musical instruments? If this isn't living in the future, I don't know what is. But above and beyond advances in hardware, one of the biggest technological revolutions in the last few decades has been information technology. When I was a kid, writing a school essay meant going to the library and looking things up in books like some kind of medieval monk. But today, <laughs> children writing their essays only have to hit control C and control V instead of writing out their plagiarism in longhand like I did. <laughs> <laughs> I kid about the plagiarism, but we have libraries of information at our fingertips, even on our phones, and we don't have to ask librarians to help us find it. With the internet, you can correspond or even talk face-to-face -face with people all over the globe, read a rare book online, walk through a museum on another continent with virtual reality, and watch hours of videos of cats sitting in boxes. <laughs> 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 but while the internet and home computers are ubiquitous now, they too were once the stuff of science fiction. 
1967, in the movie 1999 AD, they gave their idea of what the near future would look like. And they correctly predicted home computers, webcams, even online commerce and banking. Although when they promised us that the housewife will be able to do her shopping in the comfort of her own home, <coughs> they still imagined that the husband would have to examine all of her transactions before sending them to the store. <laughs> Some science fiction has predicted changing attitudes, though. Going back to Star Trek, in the days of segregation and the struggle for civil rights, they showed an integrated crew with all colors and nationalities working together instead of at odds. They even had minorities in positions of authority. Whoopi Goldberg recalls at the age of nine coming across the show on television and running through the house telling her family to come quick, come quick. There's a black lady on TV and she ain't no maid. And we've gone in less than 50 years from a black woman being a bridge officer and a fictional starship being a startling thing to a black man being elected president of the most powerful nation in the world. I know some people aren't happy with the fact that there's a black president, but even Star Trek had its Klingons. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not to say that everything is positive when science fiction becomes reality. Governments employ against their own citizens surveillance capabilities that make George Orwell's 1984 look hopelessly naive. Criminals can steal not only your money, but your very identity, or compromise and control your computer if you don't know how to stop them. Bored teenagers can goad vulnerable kids into committing suicide over the internet. And Soylent Green is an actual product now. But good or bad, the world we live in today was once just a dream of things to come. In some ways, we've even exceeded the vivid imaginations of science fiction authors and screenwriters from yesteryear. What will tomorrow bring? Can you imagine what the world will look like when your grandchildren are living in the future? How did you come up with the idea for that? Well, I came up with the idea actually during the discussion of last week when we were talking about whether or not NASA should be funded or the funding should be cut. And I was thinking about, it brought to mind my grandfather's statement about you know, going from steam engines to seeing men on the moon. And I thought maybe I could go somewhere with that. Now, when you, because you can tell that you're a Star Trek fan and you've got a couple things like that. Are you amazed at the things that we have now? Oh, yeah. When I think about the things we were looking forward to when I was a kid, and we not only have many of those things, but we even exceeded them. It, it's just mind-blowing. It really does feel sometimes like we're living in the future. When I got my first smartphone and it could do GPS, that was worth the price of it alone because I'm terrible at directions. But That would be impossible. It, when it first comes out, it's amazing technology, and pretty quickly it becomes old hat. It's just commonplace.